is covering the spread. Part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We've got a big match coming up this weekend in the English Premier League. It is Liverpool versus Manchester United. Of course, I know why that's a big one. But to further explain it, we're going to talk to Austin Cass later on today to get his read on that match on Sunday, but also the full EPL slate on Saturday to get you some good bets over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here here, as mentioned by Austin Cass. Check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. You can find his EPL work and other stuff over at numberfire.com. Austin, happy Friday to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. Uh, I we I got up early this morning to watch uh, the first free practice of the Formula One season this morning. I'm going to talk about the data behind that later on today. FP2 currently going on. So I'll talk about some weird stuff to note with FP1 uh, later on. So if you want some more F1 talk after we talked about it a bit on Thursday's show, make sure you check or stick around at the end. We'll talk about that. But Austin, um, I've been doing my soccer research by scrolling Twitter and seeing Jurgen Klopp's face talking about you know stuff with Liverpool versus Man United. Seems like he's a salty kind of guy. Am I getting the proper impression? Am I now an EPL expert? How does this all work? Uh, I wouldn't say expert quite yet, but yeah, oh, yeah, he he's a funny character, and he, uh, yeah, can come off a little whiny in the press sometimes. <laughs> but we're going to talk about his team today, so I'm excited. Okay, to keep going. you will not know what this reference is, but he sounds like a Christian Horner. Uh, Christian Horner, the team principal of Red Bull uh, in Formula One. I'm just going to go ahead and make that assumption now, knowing nothing about Jurgen Klopp other than memes. Uh, so we're going to make that that association right now. We'll talk about what things that actually matter with him and talk about that match, talk about Saturday and more in just one second. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the covering the spread podcast feed, wherever you get your podcast, big couple of weeks for the show here coming up because We've got men's college basketball conference tournaments next week. We've got the NCAA tournament. We'll help fill out your brackets later on. And a lot of good stuff with betting on the NCAA tournament later on as well. That'll all be right here in the Covering the Spread podcast feed and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. So wherever you want to watch it, make sure you're subscribed, watch, or listen. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in President select states. First online and real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1 888 789 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1 800 9 with it. In Kansas and Wyoming, 1 800 522 4700 in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1 877 770 STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1 877 Hope and Y or text Hope and Y. And in West Virginia, go to 1 800 Gambler.net. Now, let's start things off here, Austin, by talking about that Sunday match we are talking about before. We've got Liverpool versus Manchester United that is uh, going on on Sunday. When you look at that match, Austin, what stands out to you? Any bets you like in that one specifically? Yeah, I think it's a really fascinating match, and I'm going to be taking Liverpool at their plus 135 money line price. Um, the general vibe around these two clubs this year couldn't be much different. United are on the rise under a new manager. They picked up a trophy last weekend in the Carabao Cup. And Liverpool, who were a preseason favorite, 
or one of the preseason favorites to win the league, have been just really out of sorts all season, struggled with injuries, haven't played well when they've been healthy. And they're they're in a real fight just to get in the top four to make the Champions League for next season. And then when these teams met earlier this year, uh, United beat them two to one. But there's a reason Liverpool are slight favorites, even though it might not make sense when you first glance at it. Despite those season-long narratives for these two rivals, uh, it's Liverpool who have the slight edge and expected goal differential. And as they've gotten healthier here in recent weeks, they started to look a little bit like the team everybody thought they would be, especially going forward. They've amassed at least 1.8 expected goals in four of their previous five Premier League matches. And they've won the XG battle in uh, five straight games in all competitions. So in short, once you kind of pop the XG hood, Liverpool haven't been as bad as the results indicate, and Manchester United haven't quite been as good as what it may seem like they've been. And then this game being at Anfield is a pretty big factor as well. Uh, Liverpool have the second best home goal differential in the league at plus 18, uh, while United are minus three goal, goal differential on the road. So all in all, I'm taking Liverpool at plus 135. And that is for the baseline money line over at FanDuel Sportsbook, plus 135 for Liverpool to win this match. I want to dig into the health of Liverpool, which you talked about. Um, Obviously, when a team is healthier now than they were before, the full season data on them may not be as relevant as it would be for a team that's had relative, you know, normalcy across the entire span. When you have a team like Liverpool that's gotten healthier, how much are you valuing the more recent data versus the full season data given that the more recent data is likely to be, I would say, more relevant. But also, I feel like the 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 helper here is it seems like when you're using stats like expected goals, it's okay to delve into a smaller sample because XG will probably stabilize more quickly. Am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, for sure. You make a lot of good points, and that's a good question. I think Liverpool is just like a really interesting case because – anybody would have had them on the short list of best teams in Europe coming into the year. And it's just really been a total disastrous season for them, like just from the get go. But I'm definitely weighing their recent results more heavily. And I'm even willing to go back into last year a little bit Mm -hmm. to see what they've done when they more resembled the team they currently have right now. But that's obviously a slippery slope and things change a lot and there's a lot of variables, but yeah, to answer your question, I'm I'm really weighing what I've seen from them the last five or so games when they've gotten Diogo Jota back and Darwin Nunez is healthy and really just starting to look like all that everybody thought they would be. Mm-hmm. So Manchester United is kind of the one team that's still alive in the futures market beyond Arsenal and Man City. They're 14 to one um, to win it all. And that's, you know, they're behind. So there's a reason for that. How skeptical are you of that ranking is like when we're stacking teams here, they're currently, you know, top three, how far beyond behind the top three are they in actuality? When you look at expected goals, advanced metrics and stuff like that. Uh, There's, there's a pretty big gap between Man City, Arsenal, and then United City and Arsenal have been the top two teams pretty much all year. The numbers bear that out. And United are probably a little bit fortunate to be in third place in the position they're in where they are really going to have to let things slip away here to not make the top four uh, and get into the Champions League for next year. But, you know, at the end of the day, the results are all that matter. Like what happens on the pitch as far as, you know, these points are in the bank. They've had a very successful season. So United fans will not be complaining at all. Right. But when you're projecting what they might do going forward, they're probably due to step back a little bit. And I would be borderline stunned if there's four or five games left and they're actually in the title race. So, yeah, it's fair to give them the respect for what they've done so far, but we're trying to project going forward. And that's a very different uh, task. OK, so Austin likes Liverpool plus 135 to win that match on Sunday. We got six games, though, on Saturday. It looks like there's one other on Sunday as well. When you look at those other games, the non-Liverpool uh, versus Manchester United matches, Austin. Where are you seeing value right now at FanDuel Sportsbook? I've got my eye on the Leicester City-Southampton match, particularly Southampton's money line, which is plus 175. Um, and I'm also interested in them at plus 100 in the tied no-bet market. So you can make a decent 
case based on narratives and how important this game is for Southampton, and I'll do that in a second, but there's a data back case for the Saints too. By expected goal differential, Southampton have been the better team than Leicester by a decent margin. Despite being last in the table on points, Southampton's 13th by expected goal differential at minus 8.8 and Leicester's 17th at minus 11.5. And this match is at Southampton, which is obviously another feather in their cap. Um, as for the narrative, this match is just crazy important for Southampton. They're currently three points adrift at the bottom of the table and four points from safety. So if they're going to get out of the bottom three and survive this season, they really need to win these home matches against the other sides near the bottom of the table. This is one of those winnable games for them. And they desperately need to get at least a point, like at a minimum, they need to get a draw, which is what interests me in the tie no bet market because if, if they have a 1-0 lead late or things are tied late, Southampton will be doing everything in their power to hold on to that tie or to that lead. So um, obviously teams always play hard, but this is just a, a dynamic they have in soccer over there that we don't have in sports here. You know, sometimes it's actually the opposite with teams are trying to lose when they're at the bottom, but Southampton will be doing everything just humanly possible to try to get at least a draw tomorrow. I want to ask you your, your general philosophy around um, handling the regular money line market versus the tie no bet market. And obviously here there is a narrative reason for looking at the tie no bet market. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is that you typically get a lower hold in that market as well. Um, so right now, uh, Southampton is, is even money. Leicester is minus 116. So the hold in that market is 3.7%. Whereas the hold in the market with a tie, as odds just got taken down for some reason, uh, but before they got taken down, the hold in the market where you could bet on a tie was 5.12%. So by taking the tie no bet market, you're actually betting into a lower hold market. And my conspiracy theory, it might not be a conspiracy theory, but the, the thought process there is a lot of people don't want to bet ties so they can jack up... Um, the hold in those markets, as people will try to t bet into those instead. That odds just came back up, and they're the exact same. So uh, no serious concerns there. But I think that that's kind of, to me, as someone who likes to bet into lower hold markets, that's why I would find the tie no bet market a bit more attractive and even money, even though you're not getting as good of a number. I think the the presence of a tie and the fact that, like you said, a draw matters a lot to them, like that's a very valuable thing. I think both those aligned to make the tie no bet market for me the much preferred spot in this one yeah i agree for sure even without the narrative i'm i'm kind of a sucker for the tie no bet market just because right in the past i've been burnt many times <laughs> and those really like their scars and they stick with you of a team yeah really playing great and then the other team scores a goal at the end and ties it and it's your money line bet's gone so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for the tie no bet market for a lot of the reasons you just listed. And I think it, you know, the narrative really pushes me over the edge for this one with how hard right. Southampton will be clinging to any result that they have. Yes, yeah, so that market right now is even money against Southampton in the tie no bet market at even money. If you want to go the other route with the uh, the money line with the tie included, you can go plus 175 on Southampton there as well. What about player props, Austin? When you get the board in terms of those for Saturday and for Sunday, uh, what are you seeing there? So in the uh, Chelsea Leeds match, um, I really like. It should be it's one of the first Saturday. Sorry, I really like Kai Havertz to score or assist, which is plus one hundred five. Um, as we talked about last week, Chelsea are due for positive regression. It did not happen in the Spurs match that we talked about, but they've now scored just three goals from eleven point seven xG over their last eight matches, which is a really staggering difference. In away matches, Leeds have allowed the fourth most goals in the Premier League. And I think Saturday is finally the day that Chelsea's going to get right. Um, really like the idea of getting their striker to score or assist that plus money. And of course, this is assuming that Havert starts at striker. So with how much they've been struggling and he hasn't really been producing, it's not a given that he's going to start. So I'm going to wait until lineups come out at 9 a.m. Eastern time before placing this bet. But if he's starting, I striker for them. I really like him at plus 105 to score or assist. So in the NBA and other markets, we'll see markets shift significantly once a 
a lineup comes out and we know, okay, player X is starting, et cetera, et cetera. With EPL, how willing are you to bet player props before those lineups come out? Because A, you, you might get a better number, uh, but B, there is that risk that that player may not start. So what's your risk tolerance there? Uh, how much do the markets move once lineups are announced and stuff like that if people are trying to you know dive into the stuff for the first time and don't know the intricacies of that? Yeah, that's that's a really great point. So I'm usually pretty hesitant with player props unless it's a really big game where a team's almost for sure going to put out their best lineup. And so you can feel very confident in a guy starting, but typically that's going to be reflected in the number anyway. Yeah. But yeah, with this one, if he's in the starting lineup, we could see it jump to like even money or maybe even minus 105. So there's sure. some value in taking him now, but you could also get burnt because – if he's not starting and he doesn't come on at all, the bet will be voided. But if he doesn't start, he's a good enough player that will probably come on as a sub. Right. And then you're banking on him to score a goal in probably like 20 minutes or something. So, uh, yeah. But a lot of times, just like with sports here, unless a lineup comes out and it's just really shocking, the team's sitting a bunch of guys. Right. The lines aren't going to move that much. And, you know, those – those odds makers have a way of finding out that information before us. So they can just by looking at the lines, you can come sometimes predict what's about to come. Sure. Yeah. I fell the wrong way on that last night. I uh, thought that, Oh, six or six and a half point favorites. Tyrese Halliburton's playing had to scramble. While I was at the mall at the last second to get him out of my lineup. So uh, I tried to do that last night, not successfully. And uh, that's why they're better at this than I am. Um, mm -hmm. But hopefully things go well. That's Kai Havertz to score or assist plus one Oh five in the Chelsea versus Leeds match. That is Austin Cass. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work over at numberfire.com. Got an EPL helper. I'll be up later on today to break down um, Saturday's slate. Austin, good luck to you this weekend. Have fun uh, watching the matches. And we'll talk to you again next week uh, to do uh, soccer, but then we'll have some college basketball just around the corner as well. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. Alrighty. Thank you, Austin. Again, he is on Twitter at Austin Cass and excited to have Austin to talk some college basketball later on, because again, not my forte. So we're going to lean on others to educate us in those departments where I do not have any expertise. Now, let's talk about Formula One, because they just had free practice number one this morning. I'm recording this during free practice number two. So I'm not going to analyze the actual data from free practice one, because it'll be outdated, old, bad by the time you actually consume this. One thing I want to touch on, though, was an important thing to safeguard yourself against if you are just getting into F1 for the first time and checking out practice data is make sure you're accounting for certain things, primarily tire compounds, because let's use FP1 this morning as an example in Bahrain. In FP1, you had the two Red Bulls very fast, Perez one, Verstappen three with uh, Fernando Alonso between the two of them. They were crazy fast, well above everybody else in the field. The problem with that is that neither Ferrari driver uh, had their fastest lap come on the soft tire compound. They were on the mediums. Same thing for Mercedes. Same thing for Alpine. So if you look at the top four teams in the constructor standings last year, three of them did not run a lap on the soft tire compounds. So the soft tire compounds, if you're not aware, they don't last as long, but they're much faster on a single lap. So if you're going to put out your best lap and try to churn that best lap out, you're going to do it on the soft tires, ideally on lower fuel loads and stuff like that as well. We didn't see that in FP1 for a lot of teams. So for Charles Leclerc, uh, Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, George Russell, Esteban Ocon, Nick DeVries, Pierre Gasly, Alexander Albin, Carlos Sainz all had their fastest lap on mediums. Logan Sargent was on the hards. And I think that if you're trying to model this out, trying to... <clears throat> Analyze practice data. I would say that's probably one of the most important things uh, you need to be aware of is different tire compounds. The softest tires will be fastest almost every single time. Uh, medium tires are that hard. And if a lot of teams ran softs in one practice and another team did not, make sure you account for that. So what I do is I adjust. Um, I will make an adjustment in there for the teams that have their fastest lap on the median compounds and just kind of, you know, Trim their lap times based on um, the gap <clears throat> the gap for that week between the softs and the mediums, or it'll change every every racetrack because sometimes the soft tires are much better. Sometimes they're better, but not as big of a difference. So you can find that data 
um, just by if you watch, they will show the tire compound on the running order that'll show you, okay, this is the tire they were using when they set their fastest lap. Uh, GP Fans is a website that after practice lists out the practice data and it'll tell you on which tire compound the driver set that fastest lap. So once I make those adjustments in free practice one, honestly, wasn't a, there weren't a ton of huge surprises based on the data. I think that Alonzo's time was still very good, uh, even after adjusting for the fact that he did it on sauce. Uh, the Red Bulls were still extremely fast. So I'm not saying disregard what they did. I'm saying don't don't uh, undercount Mercedes, Ferrari, and stuff like that, and Alpine as well, just because they never ran the soft. So didn't talk about that yesterday. Probably should have, but we'll talk about it now. Um, something to be very aware of when it comes to practice data to make sure you are not penalizing teams for not pushing to put out the fastest single lap they possibly could. FB2 will probably be different. I'm guessing teams making uh, qualifying runs because it's more similar conditions now than it will be or to qualify tomorrow than free practice one was. So keep that in mind. Something to be aware of for every uh, Formula One practice. Make sure you're accounting for tire compounds and stuff like that. It does matter a lot. And not doing so will likely lead you down some very poor paths. Again, hopefully this doesn't age super poorly based on FP2. We'll see. I'm going to go watch that right now to see what I can learn from that for Sunday's race. That is all that we have here for today and this week on Covering the Spread. But we are back once again next week with NBA, NHL, PGA, talk some NASCAR. Uh, we'll talk some EPL. We'll have it all covered here in this same place. So go make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts to get these right as they are posted each and every weekday. Big thank you once again to Austin Cass. Find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. You can check out his work at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across tonight and this weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 